Okay, hi, Mr. Pulley here for History of Western Civilization at Fieldcrest High School, looking at the causes of World War I, some underlying problems that lead to this horrific event that is World War I, uh, an event so horrific it startles the world and all the countries involved unfortunately only after the fact. These are nationalism and imperialism, militarism and alliances. Let's take a look at how these things all combine together to form this terrible nightmare. Nationalism, again, we've defined this in the past of this being that unique cultural identity of a people based on the common language, uh, religion, cultural symbols, uh, whether it be the flag, a national bird, whatever it is we, we agree on. These are things. And this idea of nationalism is also based on ethnic issues. That's what these things are, you know, common language, religion, cultural symbols. And this is no more more prevalent than in the Balkan regions of Europe. This is that region that was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it's between uh, Austria-Hungary, essentially, and Greece. Uh, during the Balkan Wars in 1912, uh, the Ottoman Empire loses that territory, but it's absorbed by other existing countries. And so, unfortunately, those countries, those nationalist groups, don't get their own countries. And this is going to make this linger on as a problem. Uh, here we see the powers that be in Europe. Uh, we got the Kaiser there in, in the middle, the Austrian uh, emperor here towards the front, uh, England and uh, France there in the back, and even Russia there with a the beard. Uh, these guys are trying to put the lid on the uh, bowling pot of uh, Balkan troubles. Not a good time to put a lid on something once it's already on the boil. Imperialism, this is that idea of the extension of one nation's power over other lands. And this is something we've seen uh, trying to get territories. And it's not just European nations doing this. Even the United States does that with uh, the Spanish-American War and taking over Cuba. Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines. And so we're involved in this as well. And in fact, we've kind of squeaked our way into Hawaii as well in the same time period. Uh, this is uh, also more prevalent. You think about the European nations with this, uh, those spheres of influence in China where they carted those territories. And the United States, in fact, came in with the open door policy and everyone can trade anywhere. Interestingly, at this table, the Japanese there, new to the game at the after beating the Russians in the Franco, or excuse me, in the Russo Japanese War in 1904. Uh, then also, of course, that's the famous conference in Berlin, where here's Bismarck being shown carving up Africa for all the dignitaries of the uh, countries of Europe. Uh, notice missing from there at the table any Africans. Moving on here to militarism, this is that idea of the glorification of war and the aggressive preparation for war. Now, why were we prepared to actually have a war? Well, we thought this was going to be over quickly. Most European wars had only lasted a few weeks for the most part, so what's the big deal? You know, if few men get lost, we beat up our neighbors and it's over, and we, hey, are great for us. Now, this is a problem, however, because, you know, we this idea that it won't last long and we're happy to send our men off and they go off in parades and, and their wives and sisters and, and mothers are happy to see their sons go to glory for their country. Uh, they won't be so happy in a few years. Okay. This leads to uh, iconic symbols of nationalism, actually, here uh, that are used to advance militarism. We have Uncle Sam here wanting you for the U.S. Army. Yeah, that's you, even you in the back. And the British equivalent, Lord Kitchener there, um, wanting you to serve your country as well, uh, if you happen to be British. Then, of course, with all this militarism, well, if you're a smaller country, it's like being the small guy when the big bully wants to pick on you. What do you do? You get some friends, okay? And so these treaties of mutual protection between countries in order to maintain a balance of power. Here is uh, sort of the... Uh, landscape of things before the war begins. We've got uh, the Triple Entente over here. This is Russia, France, and Britain. Uh, Britain coming late to that alliance to help out France and Russia. Um, and the Triple Alliance on the other side, which is in blue there, Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Germany. And then, of course, the trouble in the middle, that's Bulgaria and Serbia. That would be the Balkans in the purple. And then the Ottoman Empire, which is sort of the, the weak old man. Well, the Ottoman Empire will join the uh, Triple uh, Alliance later after it's no longer a Triple Alliance because Italy will pull out and join in on the side of the Triple Entente, and that will change the map to sort of this. Uh, the Triple Entente is actually now referred to as the Allies, because it's not just Great, uh, United Kingdom, France, and Russia. It also includes Italy. Okay, we also got Romania joining in Serbia and Montenegro and other places in Greece joining as well. The Central Powers, well, they're not the Triple uh, Alliance anymore, because it's Germany, Austria, Hungary, and now it's Belgium instead, and the Ottoman Empire joins, or Turkey. Uh, in fact, that will be one part, place in the war, where the British will be handed a resounding defeat.
Okay, so how does this all tie together? Well, World War I, this was the Great War or the war to end all wars as we refer to afterwards because of the horrific nature and casualty figures of the war, which we'll get to here in just a minute. Let's look again here. We've got the arms race, those nationalist movements, everyone wanted their own country. Uh, and we see here this pile of dried timber. We've got pan-Slavism, triple alliances, triple entente, colonial rivalries, Alsace-Lorraine, which is that uh, region between France and, and Germany, uh, which Germany took in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 to get uh, their country unified and to beat up on France a little bit. We see some matches here that didn't take, you know, Bosnia, uh, Algiers, uh, the uh, Balkan Wars and so on. But the one match, you know, the slit that's about to hit, that's Sarajevo. And in Sarajevo, that's where Archduke Francis Ferdinand is uh, assassinated and then Austria-Hungary will declare war on Serbia and then Russia gets involved and Germany gets involved and everyone else's alliances that's the problem so let's look at all this together here that extreme nationalism on top the French revenge against Germany again as I said for Alsace Lorraine and the Franco-Prussian War you get that pan-Slavism the idea of getting you know Slavic uh, countries free from both the Ottoman Empire but also free from uh, uh, Austria-Hungary as well, German pride in their military and industrial growth and, and all these things going on. Uh, we also have aggressive imperialism. Hey, if we want to be a powerful country, we have to have overseas territory. So there's this mad scramble and carving up parts of the world uh, to create many uh, territory battles between countries in those regions. Uh, the British and the French uh, trying to get hold of German territories, especially in Africa. That's not going to work out for them until after the war. Uh, military power, again, this is seen as a sense of national prestige. So the arms race is, is a reflection of nationalism here. The glorification of war by all powers, that arms race, guns, navies, army size, machine guns now involved, although we'll fight with old school, outdated tactics. Uh, and of course, military, many of the world's leaders, military men, what's their answer to things? Military option. Okay, then there's this tangle of alliances. Again, I said, if you're the weaker guys, you got to find somebody to help back you up, so maybe we'll make it seem like it's not a good choice to try and fight any of us. However, the Triple Alliance, the Triple Entente, which we say later becomes the Central Powers, and the Allies, eh, we ignore things and get involved anyway. The result, at the end, will end up being millions and millions and millions of deaths. Battlefield deaths. These are battlefield deaths in armies only engaged in the, the war at the time, uh, 1.7 million in Russia died in battles, 1.6 Germany, uh, 1.3, almost 1.4 million from France, British Empire, 900,000, Austria, 800,000. The figures go on and on there. You see the United States, only 50,000. Why so few for us? We don't get involved until the last year, and then not even all of that. By well, that time, Germany's on the verge of collapse, along with Austria, hum Austria and Turkey and the other central powers. That's a quick brief introduction to the background that leads to World War I. We'll talk more about um, imperialism in chapter 21 and 22 and more about the war itself in chapter 23. See you then.